We're so glad you're here with us, uh, whether you're watching in the campus or online. We're starting a brand new series on Psalm 23. Um, the only downside to talking about perhaps one of the most famous portions of Scripture is that we have a tendency to think, oh, I already know that. And sometimes we, at Family Church, we look at a topic and say, what does this teach us about fear or about love? And we look at all the Bible and what we can learn about it. And sometimes we focus on a book, and like we did Wisdom from Proverbs, or we're looking at a specific book, like the book of Ephesians. And for the next six weeks, we are going to go even on a deeper dive. We're going to spend one week on each verse as we walk through Psalm 23. And so it's going to be an exciting time. It's going to be a time when I hope that you can get away from, I already know this, and really drill down on, Okay, what does this say to me, and how can I learn from this? And we're going to start with something that we don't usually do, and that is we're going to read it together. So if you have your paper copy, uh, then just open that up. We've got it here, and we're using the ESV version. And so if you're looking on new version, uh, switch over to the ESV version. Uh, if you're watching on the app, it's on there. And we're just going to read this kind of slowly and thoughtfully together. And begin that process of saying, Lord, I want you to make this real to me. I want to, I want to learn not just intellectually, but I want, to, I want to have a heart response to, okay, what does this mean to me? So this is the picture of Psalm 23, the different aspects. As we look at the different parts of the, of the slide, you'll see that Psalm 23, my shepherd is the theme, and then Green pastures, still waters, deep valleys. So that's what we're going to read through together. So let's read this out loud, wherever you are, living room or in an, in an auditorium. Let's stand together and let's read this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I chose the ESV. It's a good translation, but I think in this chapter, it really just does the best job. And we're going to look at this from a couple of different lenses. We're going to look at it through the fact that, that God is called the shepherd, and he leads his people like a, a shepherd leads his sheep. And that's a common picture in several parts of the Old Testament. And then we're going to look at the lens of David, who wrote this psalm. And as a young boy, if you know his story, he was a shepherd out in the fields. And he knows what that relationship is like, intimately a shepherd leading and caring for and protecting his sheep. And then we're also going to look at, not today, but in other, other weeks of this series, John 10, where Jesus stands up and says, that great shepherd you've been looking for, that's me. And so hopefully those lenses will help us see this very familiar passage of scripture with new eyes. And so our outline is really simple. The Lord, my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. I will not be in want. And I want to drill down on each one of those and what does that mean? And so he, David starts with the Lord. Now, what he's saying there is very obvious. In a world of many, many gods, when, when the nation of Israel was in Egypt, there was the calf god and the river god and the frog god, and there were thousands of gods. And when they moved into the land of Israel, land of Canaan, there was Baal and Ashtaroth and, and, and uh, Moloch and Dagon, and there were all kinds of... that. Each people group had their own god that they worshipped, and there were gods for specific purposes, like for rainfall or fertility. And so this, this idea that there were many, many, many gods was embedded in all the culture, and and he said, I want you to know that this is the Lord. Now, maybe you don't have a great grasp on your English vocabulary, but 
There's a difference between the, which is called a definite article, and a, which is an indefinite article. So my mom explained this as I was a kid. She was an English major, and, and so she, uh, she said, you know, here's the difference. Your dad came to bed the other night, and I had made two pies. I had made a large pie and a smaller pie with what was left over. And your dad said, as he got home late from a meeting and then had a little snack and then he came to bed, he said, I had a little pie before I came to bed. And mom was like, whatever, you probably had a piece of pie, that's fine. And then she got up the next morning and saw that the entire small pie was gone. And she realized that what he meant was, I had the little pie. Now, I've never forgotten the difference between an indefinite and a definite article after that. But David says, there is only one God, and he is the Lord. And then, in fact, there's something deeper here that you can't see in the English, and that is this word Lord represents one of the very special names of God. So in any translation, in any culture, when we translate the Bible, you have to choose a word to use for God or words to use for God to describe him. And so in the Hebrew, as you go back underneath the word God, there is, when you see in your English translation, the word God, it means Elohim, and it simply means mighty one. It usually refers in the Bible to the true God. Sometimes it refers to idols and false gods. Crazy, it even in, sometimes refers to like government officials or people who are in authority, that they're mighty ones. And so it's a very generic word, kind of like our word gods. And then if you see capital L-O-R-D, that is representing the Hebrew word Adonai. And that means what our English word should mean, which is Lord or Master or Boss. And so that could also be used mostly of the true God, but occasionally other peoples would call other gods Lord. And then there's the special name that is always shown with all capital letters. And that represents the name Yahweh, or some people don't understand that Yahweh became Jehovah in some translations. And the, and the reason that's so special is because it was a covenant name where God made an agreement with the nation of Israel. And it comes in Exodus 3 where Moses is on the backside of the desert looking at a burning bush. And God says to him, I want you to go down to Egypt and I want you to rescue my people. And Moses obviously thinks that's an overwhelming task. He thinks he's a failure. He thinks he can't do it. And so he starts making excuses. But one of the excuses he makes is, well, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to tell you, God came, God came to me and told me to come set you free. And they're going to be like, which God? Who is God? What's his name? And there's a very, very powerful in the Jewish culture an identification with a person's name and their character. And he said, what am I supposed to tell them when they say, which God are you talking about? And he said, I want you to tell them that the I am sent you. Or some translations, it's the I am that I am. And that's kind of a mysterious name. Um, there's a lot of deep meaning there. That God says, I am the source of everything. I don't need somebody to help me. I wasn't created. I have always been. It means that I'm powerful and a Big God, above all things. It means that I don't ask anybody's advice. It means I don't need help from anybody. I am the source and the power behind everything. And that word, I am, is as close as we can transliterate it. It is Yahweh. And it's a four-letter Greek word, and it's the sacred name of God. And I'm not suggesting that you have to speak Hebrew to talk to God, but I want you to see that David uses that big, important, incredible term. And he says, the Lord, the creator of the universe, the, the Yahweh is my shepherd. There is only one God. And he's an amazing God because the name of God then underscores his character, that he's the creator of everything. That when God makes promises to us, he can keep them because he's powerful. And obviously the picture of a shepherd shows that he's there to to lead and to protect and to, to provide for. And the reason that we can trust the promises of the shepherd is because the shepherd is Yahweh. So the Lord is my shepherd and the, my shepherd is the Lord. And so he leans in right to start with to talk about how huge God is and how 
important and big he is. And there's, there's like a mystery in our understanding of God. I, I love the quote where it said, the most important thing in your mind is your perception of God. And I hope we can stretch that a little bit as we talk about God being our shepherd. I hope it becomes more meaningful in your own personal experience with God. But he says, the Lord, and then he does the next line, is my shepherd. And you and I maybe have kind of a, a tendency to over-romanticize the picture of shepherd, that a shepherd is such a, a wonderful guy who cares for his little lambs. In fact, a lot of the pictures that we use for Jesus as the shepherd, it really looks like he's a blow-dried shampoo commercial. <laughs> like, like his clothes are clean, the lambs look perfect, um, the, the scene outside looks like it should have a symphony orchestra behind it. And we get this kind of schmaltzy picture of God being our shepherd. And, and really, the, the shepherds of the day, were they lived outdoors all the time. They were usually uneducated. They had often very few resources. It was, it was like the, the bottom of the uh, employment totem pole. It was for boys who weren't old enough to work yet, which is actually where we see David's picture. That David was the kid that when his father was asked, which of your sons should I anoint as king? Because the prophet Samuel had come to their house and said, one of your sons is going to be king. And he walked through all of the older brothers and he didn't even call David because he was just the shepherd. He was the kid out. And the other parts of shepherds were, were the old who could no longer do other work and they could just, because it was a fairly sedentary job most of the time, and, and they could just take it easy. So the picture of shepherd was lowly in the, in the status of the culture. It was difficult work. They were out in the sun and the rain and all day. They often lived in caves or shelters that they just made for themselves. So here's this amazing idea that the God of the universe, the Lord, is my personal shepherd, that he's humbled himself to be small enough to care about me, to care about us. And it's a picture that shows not only the incredible power and character of God, it shows the, the love and the individual care. And if you look through the psalm there, he says, I am not going to want because my shepherd is going to lead me. My shepherd is going to provide for me. My shepherd is going to protect me. And, uh, and we need that. So I have a friend who is an elder here at the church as well, and his name is Brett Findlay. And he was telling me a hilarious story about his shepherding. And so he, he was getting ready to drive to work, and it was a cold, rainy, winter Oregon day. And he looks across the field, and he sees this old ewe that is all caught in blackberry bushes. And not only that, there is water running across this field, but the water has collected in a, a little ditch in the middle of the field, and so that there's a whole little stream running through because of the recent rains. And Ah, oh, he sighs and he drives his pickup out there close to the to the the little river that's running through and he looks over there and he thinks, I gotta rescue the sheep because one of my other friends who's a shepherd said, Sheep are looking for a comfortable place to die. They're born looking for a comfortable place to die. And and even though they they can be willful and even uh ornery, they often just give up when they're caught. And I, and a sheep like that that's caught in the blackberries will just stand there or fall down and they'll die eventually because they can't get out. And they just kind of go passive. They just kind of give up. So he goes out there and he takes off his shirt and he takes off his boots and takes the wallet out of his pants and, and he starts going out towards his sheep and he's wading through this freezing cold water. And he said he got over there and he, he's pulling away all these blackberries and he's getting his arms and hands all cut up and Finally, he gets this smelly, soaked animal out of the blackberries, and he's trying to get her back across, and she's not cooperating. So he finally picks her up and takes her and wades through the stream again, and he puts her down, and he kind of pushes her towards the rest of the sheep. And, and he turns around, 
and he's picking up his shirt to kind of start drying himself off. And all of a sudden, that sheep comes and takes him out at the knees, and he falls on the ground, and the sheep goes right back across that little stream and right back into the blackberries. <laughs> I just, I laughed and laughed at that story because, you know, shepherds need a great deal of patience. And I am thankful that the Lord is a more patient shepherd than I am because I'm afraid that that sheep is too much like me and maybe too much like you. So David is saying, the Lord of the universe is my shepherd and he leads me. He leads me sometimes by still waters and quiet streams and sometimes through the valley of the shadow of death. And he provides for me and he protects me. And therefore... He says the next statement, which is, now that I get all that, I, I realize that that is my identity, that he is my shepherd, which means I'm his sheep. There's a cool psalm, a song that comes out of Psalm 95.7. It says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And, you know, I think that's such a beautiful picture that says, first of all, being a Sheep of the shepherd is not a solo sport. It is a group sport. He is a, he is a shepherd for us. We are a flock. We, we need each other and we need a shepherd. And then he says in that psalm, he says, we have accepted that role. We are his sheep. You know why we're important? Not because we're important, but because we belong to the shepherd. And then he says, not only that, but my response comes out of that that what is the response that the shepherd wants from a sheep? And the shepherd is to lead. And what is the response? The sheep only have one duty, which is to respond to the voice of the shepherd, to, to submit to his leading, to follow him, to trust him, and to be a good sheep. And, you know, I, I think in the current, <laughs> all kinds of controversies and name-calling, one of the terms that has become kind of a, a name that people call each other from different sides is a sheeple. And the inference is you don't think for yourself. You're not really an independent person. You're just following some pastor or leader or political party or whatever whatever the the current debate is. But the the, the word sheeple is a real put down. It's like you're you're just going along with the flock. You're just following. You're just listening. And I guess I have news for you. We are all sheeple. The only question is, who's your shepherd? Because even the people who are arrogant and independent and saying you're following the government, you're a sheeple. You're following that pastor, you're a sheeple. They're following someone themselves. They're together in a, in, in a flock following a different shepherd. And so the difference isn't who are the sheeple. The difference is sheeple, who, are, who is your shepherd? And that's an identity thing that says, just as we talked about the gospel, that I belong to Jesus. That's who I am now. That my life is built on the fact that I have a shepherd and I belong to him. He is my shepherd and I am his sheep. And if you're his sheep, then we are part of the same flock. And maybe we have differences and maybe we don't see things all the same, but, but we belong together. And then he goes on and he talks only about the Lord is my shepherd, but he says the result then, and I, wanna, I want us to focus on this because I think this is such an important heart moment. He says, I have everything I need. I know the psalm we read says, I shall not want, which is a very interesting phrase because in this book that we uh, are kind of focusing on as we walk through Psalm 23, this is, we're not preaching out of this. This is just like an extra thing for you to read to help you really connect your heart to this passage, and it's, it's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, and it's written by Philip Keller. It's written quite a while ago, and he talks about his experiences as a shepherd when he ran sheep, but he also lived in Africa where he watched the lifestyle of a Mid-Eastern shepherd with his sheep, and, and he, brought, he brings out some interesting insights and brings out some good questions about it, but he talks about the fact that this idea that I shall not want really has two prongs to it that it means that we have a good shepherd and he takes care of us. He provides for us. Um, he tells a story in his own book about a neighbor who also carried sheep and, and he tried to be conscientious to make sure his 
pastures were in good shape and his his animals had the food that they needed and the minerals they needed and they were sheared at the right time and taken care of and his neighbor was the opposite. He didn't repair his fences, he didn't worm them, he didn't take care of them and and therefore they looked terrible. And so the first idea is that we are well provided for because we have an amazing shepherd. But he said there's another underlying meaning to that, and that is, I will not be wanting. I will be content with what the master has provided for me. And that is a really, really important understanding. So let's walk into that just a little bit more deeply. He says, I have everything I need, which means that when I come to say, God is my shepherd and I'm his sheep, that means I'm going to trust how he takes care of me. You know, a lot of times we pray to God like we are advising him on what we think he should do for us. And I don't know how this works in your life, but um, he often has very different plans for me than my plans for myself. His plans involve waiting. His plans often involve not getting something I think I want. It doesn't mean I'll never have, I'll have everything I want. It means I will have everything that I need. And in fact, this important picture is that if God is a good shepherd, and we go back to this fruit to root thing that we talked about several weeks ago, if I'm angry because I don't have what I need, if I'm envious of what somebody else has, if I'm dissatisfied, discontent, what does that mean that I believe about myself? It means I believe that I should be able to choose for myself what I want, that I should be able to get what I feel like I need. What does it mean I believe about God? I mean, it really means I believe that God's not doing a very good job as a shepherd, that he's not providing and protecting and leading like I need him to. And so as you go through that process, you decide, I am going to trust that what God has provided for me is enough for right now. Now, in the psalm that we're looking at, I don't know if you caught it, but sometimes he leads us in green pastures and still waters. That's the awesome good times. Then just a few verses later, he says, sometimes he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. And it should be obvious that none of our lives are all in the green pastures and still waters. That there is a, a rhythm that's individual to you and to me of the difficulties and the blessings that come into our life. And it's easy for us to begin to look at what somebody else gets and compare ourselves. In fact, in this, in this book, he talks about a sheep that he had, and he said it was a beautiful sheep, great wool, had great lambs, good and healthy. It was a smart sheep, but he said it could never stay put. That no matter how good the pasture was that he'd provided, it always wanted to go through the fence. If there was a hole anywhere, it got through it, sometimes even knocked over the fence. And pretty quick, the lambs that it had started following it through. Pretty quick, other people or other sheep from the same flock started doing the same thing. And he said, I named her Mrs. Gadabout. And there's a deep tendency in each one of us to always want more. That when I, I think of my life, my car should get nicer. My job should be better paid as I go through life. I, I, my houses should get bigger. My, my, my health should be better. And we might not say that out loud, but when it doesn't happen, when God allows tragedy, when God allows us to go through lean times, it's easy to get angry. Interesting, there's a, a problem on the other side too. Sometimes God is pouring riches into our life and things are good and we are enjoying it. And it's easy to begin to focus on the blessings of God instead of God himself. I, I love God because he gives me all this stuff. And of course, the story of Job is what happens if God takes the stuff away. Do you love God or do you just go love God's blessings? And in this, this phrase that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I will not be in want. It means I will trust the shepherd that what he's doing in my life is okay. It's enough. And in fact, sometimes I think God shakes the things that he's given us, the blessings. Um, sometimes he takes them away because we've turned them from blessings into idols. We've 
We've come to see them as the end or, or the source of our happiness instead of the shepherd. And so he first of all says that we have to trust God that he will be our provider and that I have everything that God says I need. And the second part of that is cultivating the attitude of contentment that I need to not only remind myself that God is my shepherd and he's given me this for right now, but I need to build intentionally a spirit of gratitude and of belief and trust. And I remember right when I got out of college, I, I had been planning to move into ministry, but I had no leads and I didn't know where I was going to go. And you know how everybody asks you when you're getting out of college, what are you going to do next? And where are you going to work? And, you know, I didn't know. And I felt a little panicked. And I was reading one day in my devotions about the story of Elijah. And in the Old Testament, there's a prophet named Elijah, and he proclaimed that there was going to be this drought for three years and that nothing was going to, no rain, no growth. And then God told him to go back in the backside of the desert, and he was by this little brook, and the ravens brought food to him. And I always thought, oh, that's so cool when I was a kid. I love that story. And then I grew up and found out what ravens actually are like, and I thought, eh, that'd be kind of grody. But um, it, it's a picture of him sitting there waiting for God's work to happen. And then it says, when the brook dried up, then God said, here's your next assignment. And that was like a light bulb for me. I thought, you know, he probably was watching that brook, and first it was a nice little brook, and then it was a little bit less, and then it was down to a little trickle, and, you know, the last day I'm seeing him put his cup and trying to get a little bit enough to drink for just to not die. And he could have been panicking all the time because the brook was drying up. God, what am I going to do? And that... That same picture came as the Lord said to me, Paul, I'll tell you when I'm ready to tell you. And until then, just rest and trust that I will tell you. And I'll, it did. It gave me a peace. It's like, okay, God's got this. I, I can trust my shepherd to know what he's doing. And that builds contentment in our future direction. It builds contentment in our the, the resources that we have right now. And I don't know where you are. There's been a lot of things this last couple of years that have not been like we wanted them to be. And it's easy for us to begin to list all of the frustrations and tensions and maybe even suffering and loss. And it's easy for those to, to inform our head and then influence our heart. And it's easy to become cynical and bitter and frustrated. And I want you just to, to step back and ask yourself, am I living contentedly? Am I trusting the shepherd? And I want to give you a verse from Philippians where the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says something very, very profound about this. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need. He had asked him for a gift and thanked him for a gift. And he says, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Did you get that line? I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. You have to go through many, many cycles of highs and lows before you learn how to be content in the high and in the low. And he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. So when David is writing this and he's saying, I have everything I need, it doesn't mean that his life was perfect. When the Apostle Paul is says, I've learned to be content, you know, you look at David's life, some of the time he was the king. Some of the time he was running around the backside of the desert with his father-in-law trying to kill him. He didn't always know where he was going to eat or what he was going to drink. And yet he said, I have all that I need. And Paul said, I've learned the cycles of life. Sometimes I'm in need, sometimes I have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So he's given us an incredibly important gift. He says, contentment is a gift from God. It's not a matter, it's not a function of how much money or how your bank account is or how your health is or, or what the, the people around you are doing. It's a function of being in touch with the shepherd. If we are truly submitted to and following and trusting the shepherd, then we can have contentment 
no matter what the circumstances of your life. So I want to wrap this up with a big statement. So sometimes it's easy to get a lot of details as we go through the scripture like this. And I want you to see that here's what I think the first verse is about. The creator of the universe has humbled himself to be my personal shepherd. He promises to lead and protect and provide for me if I will become his sheep. I will be content under his care. I like to say the most important word in Psalm 23 is my. Because there's no doubt that the Lord is a great, a great shepherd. David knew that. The Apostle Paul knew that. Many, many other saints. The question is, is have you said, I will follow you? Not only once when you commit your life to him and become a follower of Jesus, but every day when you say, okay, day today, God, I'm going to be a good sheep. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to cultivate contentment. I want to be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I will not live in the state of want. I have everything I need. I hope that you can do that. I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors. Just take a moment and kind of help this soak in to you wrestle with this in your own personal life. Thanks. I love you.